afternoon, everybody. Um, as, as Dave said, my name is Dan Atkinson. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of Coastal Marine at Wessex Archaeology. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks to Dave and Andrew for organising the session this afternoon. Um, I'm going to take us from the dust and heat of a man to the horrible dreek wetness of the UK offshore environment and talk a little bit about infrastructure and research uh, from a marine perspective. Is that, is that any better? Is the it microphone is for our recording and not for the room. You just have to project a bit. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Sorry. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is infrastructure and research from a marine perspective. I'm just going to give a general overview of the marine historic environment and the associated marine development that uh, that uh, interacts with, and also give some examples of initiatives and mechanisms that help to drive the integration of research into marine development. I should also say that this is going to be quite sort of high level, and there will be some examples of projects, but obviously there's a lot of commercial sensitivity as well, so some of them, um, the more recent projects, we may not be able to talk about, but I will be giving some examples. So what is the marine historic environment? Uh, apologies to those of you um, who uh, I may be teaching to suck eggs, but uh, for those who don't uh, know too much about it, the marine historic environment essentially expands from the, the mean high water mark to the 12 nautical mile territorial limits and beyond to the 200 nautical mile EZ around the UK uh, off offshore zone. Um, this includes uh, various types of archaeology, submerged prehistory, of which we uh, have over, over the last few years, and as we'll see, uh, starting to understand an awful lot more about. Uh, maritime archaeology, your standard boats and ships and bits and pieces that are dropped on the seabed from seafaring and nautical activity. And also aviation archaeology, which is something that has really taken off in the last few years, particularly with offshore development, some of the finds that have come out of that. And of course this is affected by coastal and offshore development. Uh, offshore wind, marine renewables, marine cables and interconnectors, aggregates and port and harbour development of which there has been an increasing amount over the last 10 to 15 years. So the marine historic environment and marine development, the, uh, the, the map on the right there is the Crown Estate map, it's a little bit out of date since the Crown Estate split between uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK, but it gives a good indication of the sheer volume of industry that is happening offshore and the marine zone. It's also important to point out that there is a big difference between terrestrial and marine, the marine historic environment in the way that we liaise and interact with it. It's a very large area of seabed, um, the same if not more than the area of the landmass of the UK in terms of the, uh, the expanse of the 200 nautical mile limit onto the seabed. And this, uh, this also means that there's an extremely large area of seabed which is obviously less visible. We can't see things quite as well as we can on land. And this obviously has come under a lot of increasing pressure over the years from development. The legisl legislative and policy framework is becoming more developed, um, certainly over, uh, since the introduction of the various acts um, about five, five or six years ago uh, for the UK and in Scotland as well. And uh, the one issue I, I would raise is that this does suffer from a limited pool of expertise to be able to deliver policies due to this highly extensive resource and the pressures on it from development. The other point to raise is that developers obviously are usually risk averse, which means uh, avoid and leave well alone. That means we don't have the opportunity to be able to understand what the resource is in many cases and we miss out on those, those research opportunities. So. The other aspect, obviously, is the sheer, is the environment we work in and, and the sheer cost to be able to investigate within that environment, and that's another big uh, pressure in terms of how we are able to interact and develop our understanding within that environment. And the increase in construction activity, particularly, uh, which is happening now and has been started happening over the last few years, particularly with the offshore wind industry, marine cables, interconnectors, uh, and marine renewables, wave and tidal, this means that the construction activity essentially leads to more discoveries on the seabed. So one of the key issues is, is how do we deal with that, particularly from a curatorial point of view. But this gives us a massive resource to be able to start integrating what we currently know 
into something a bit more um, solid and, and watertight, pardon the pun, in terms of how we push research into the future. So research frameworks, um, in, in a nutshell, uh, some of you who were at the, the SCARF um, workshop in Edinburgh the other week might notice this, this slide. I have given it the correct accreditation, so I hope I don't get into trouble. Um, this gives an overview of the various national and regional research frameworks and where we are currently throughout the UK. And only England and Scotland have specific national level research frameworks for maritime marine archaeology. So clearly a lot more to be done there, but gives a good basis upon which we can start asking research questions and start defining objectives and how we deal with the marine historic environment resource. Also, let's not forget that the multitude of regional uh, research frameworks, Scotland is in the in process of developing uh, the same, and all the multifarious um, uh, standalone research frameworks which are developed over, over recent years. One important thing about the regional research frameworks is that maritime marine archaeology is a bit hit and miss, and unless you have the expertise at hand and the personalities involved, it's quite often the case that the marine and maritime aspects can be um, limited if, if, if indeed included at all. So that's a really important point to raise. The other thing, sorry, on the, on the research frameworks is also to point out that the statistics from the SCARF, the Scottish Archaeological Research Framework, suggests that it is the commercial sector that is using research frameworks the most. That goes without saying because that's where the majority of the work is. But that's really encouraging, particularly how we translate that into what we do as commercial units, how we work with the curators, how we work with the clients, and how this um, essentially feeds into the integration of research. So to give a few examples of uh, recent research-driven initiatives, and when I say re recent, I mean the last 10 to 15 years, there has been collaboration between developers and regulators, uh, as I say, last 10, 15 years, which has resulted in the acquisition of uh, a large corpus of archaeological data, and that is data right across the board, submerged prehistory to the modern day aviation archaeology. And this has provided an excellent opportunity to utilise the expanding baseline from which to develop our understanding through appropriate research questions driven by the various research frameworks which I've just mentioned. And there's been quite a lot done in recent years. You find that most project designs, uh, the development of written schemes of investigations will start to include a lot more research-based questions um, and objectives, which is a good thing. In terms of initiatives themselves, one of the main ones uh, is the Marine Aggregate Levy Sustainability Fund, which was through BMAPA, the British Marine Aggregates uh, Producers Association, between 2002 and 2011, <coughs> produced a huge resource to enable us to start, and to enable them to start to understand what impact their developments were having on the environment, and this included the marine historic environment. And this started with uh, regional environmental characterisation projects, to understand the bigger picture, and obviously uh, following on from that, a multitude of uh, numerous studies uh, from submerged prehistory through maritime and aviation, and some examples there of some of the reports that came out of that uh, that funding. But a really inspired initiative to, to really start helping us to understand the marine historic environment, of which until that point we knew very little, and as I say, particularly from a submerged prehistoric point of view as well. The other one is uh, the Historic International Heritage Protection Plan, and I, I, this is quite sort of Anglo-centric, and I apologise to the other jurisdictions, but obviously they, they are developing their own um, programmes too. Uh, but the National Heritage Protection Plan, which uh, has continued through Heritage 2020, has identified the priorities for um, protecting all heritage, including the marine historic environment, and there are numerous initiatives which come through that, either through calls from uh, historic England or um, unsolicited uh, uh, project proposals to try and improve upon our understanding of the resource and also introduce those crucial research questions as well. So a project example from the Marine Aggregate Levy Sustainability Fund is Area 240 and the mm -hmm. Pillar Yard Catchment Project. Uh, Area 240 is, as you can see, is a very small 
license uh, extraction area off um, East Anglia, which, uh, following on from the, the standard um, environmental impact assessment process and uh, the establishment of the correct mitigation, uh, led to the discoveries of uh, some really significant uh, finds, prehistoric finds, examples of which include the stone hand axes there, which we believe date to the early middle Paleolithic, highly significant, uh, about 250 thousand years old so this gave the impetus for the, the, the need and the requirement for more research questions to be asked and also the means to be able to answer those or to begin to, to answer those so this led on to um, a wider project um, whilst the uh, system is trying to get its head in gear um, Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, we were looking at Area 240 in what was an extremely small area, and of course, this gives us a, a sort of pinhole view of the wider landscape and what was happening, how these discoveries fitted into that landscape, or former landscape in this case. Um, and you can see there that uh, this, this study was expanded into the wider region which looked at the defence and Holocene development of the area, how the Area 240 and its finds fitted in with that, uh, and really started to give an overall picture of the submerged prehistory and, and paleo landscapes within that, within that region. So a really uh, important and significant project which helps us when we start posing research questions, to start begin to start to begin to understand the wider uh, the wider context. So the the, the final example that I'm going to talk about is the uh, London Gateway Port uh, development, uh, which is uh, a, a large uh, terminus uh, on the Thames, uh, extremely large and highly complex uh, port development. Uh, with extensive uh, linear capital dredging, about 100 kilometres in extent, um, out into the outer Thames and into the North Sea. Uh, extremely challenging and, and a, a situation which also um, provided a mixture of arch archaeological discoveries, but, but around which this was made possible through uh, um, various methodologies and approaches that were adapted between the, uh, the, the client, the consultants and the contractors to be able to deal with what became an extremely large amount of material coming off the, the estuary bed and, and seabed. So this positive approach um, adopted to the management of these discoveries uh, and to the environmental stewardship um, <coughs> produced a highly diverse range of objects um, and the results provided a, a sort of multi-period overview of the research potential and the increased understanding of what up until this point wasn't a particularly well understood um, area, particularly from a marine point of view, uh, or wholly from a marine point of view. So this gave us a great insight into the maritime past of the Thames and the, the outer Thames and, and immediate North Sea um, region. Um, and these ultimately were disseminated in academic and popular publications. Uh, we're still working on the final publication for that. Uh, project, uh, and I should say that the Oxford Archaeology actually dealt with the, the, the onshore and terrestrial aspects as well, so a really massive project. Looking at uh, very quickly at some of the discoveries, the, the map there shows uh, the, the port um, on the bottom left coming out along the dredge channel uh, for the navigation uh, entry into the Thames. Uh, it gives you a, a number of um, find spots. Initially, obviously, the, the, the um, environmental impact assessment um, was uh, associated with geoarchaeological and geophysical assessment. You can see uh, down the bottom here a bathymetric image of one of the wrecks that was discovered. Um, this is fairly recent. Um, other uh, older um, finds, such as the Elizabethan bronze cannon, the top right there, and uh, various fragments of vessels, both uh, vernacular coastal working vessels and also larger seagoing vessels too. And another extremely interesting find was the remains of a Junkers 88 German bomber from the Second World War, which uh, the, the parts of an engine, two propellers and some parachute fragments uh, recovered. 
Um, but it turned out that this was one of the prototypes that was being flown by the secretive uh, German uh, arm of the Luftwaffe at the time. Um, so in itself a highly significant find. Not possible if this project had not gone ahead. So particularly significant. And then of course we've got the, the sort of stray finds and the, the bits and pieces that are dredged up uh, as part of the um, uh, clearance process for the, for the main channel dredging. So ultimately an extremely important example of how we begin to deal with what is an, a, a massive uh, marine development um, and also some of the research potential that is able to be integrated into that um, ultimately being disseminated into, into popular and academic publications. So um, a really good example of how a, a success story like this can help us develop our understanding of how things should be pursued into the future. Now in terms of augmenting the marine historic environment resource for research potential, I mentioned the fact that we're getting a load of uh, material coming off the seabed through development, but how do we deal with that and how do we know about it in the first place? We can deal with things we do know about to a degree, but for those things that we don't know about, we need to have a mechanism to be able to, to, be able to um, uh, report on that. So these mechanisms include um, the protocol for archaeological discoveries, both the, for the BMAP uh, aggregates side of things, and uh, a little bit later on uh, for the offshore renewables industry, and then other schemes such as the Marine Antiquities Scheme, and I apologise for the rubbish uh, resolution of that logo there. Very similar to the Portable Antiquities Scheme, which is essentially encouraging the public to report fines, and this obviously adds to the corpus of archaeology that we're able to start to begin to understand. So in, in summary, um, a few mugshots there, um, I should say that uh, Dr Andrew Bickett was uh, on, the, um, on the title list to, to also talk, but um, I put him in as a, as a reserve in case I disappeared under a bus, so uh, apologies for that. Um, so really, I think in a nutshell, I hope that's given a, sort of a, a very broad overview of the types of things that we need to consider in, t in the marine historic environment. There are still um, many challenges ahead, obviously, but I think we are on the road to really starting to understand how we integrate research into the marine historic environment. And I think initiatives like the um, uh, uh, People and the Sea through the um, Historic England uh, Marine Research Framework and also the SCARF Marine Research Framework as part of the national framework is a really good start in helping us start to think about what we need to consider. So the key is, is, is the continued drive towards the full integration, integration of research potential and these sorts of questions that we need to ask uh, through effect, effective frameworks, which, which I've mentioned, uh, and the increased and continued development of uh, development-driven initiatives and mechanisms, to which some of, some of which I've alluded to. Um, the regulators and developers are tending to work better together, um, whether, whether they like it or not. Um, but there is a real, there seems to be much more of a desire now um, within these uh, regulatory frameworks for the developer to appreciate actually what benefits they and we can get out of this sort of work. Uh, and also, you know, research is not a bad word anymore, it is something that needs to be included in all the considerations in the archaeology that we deal with. Um, so that the regulator is given a, a, a more firm foundation from which to work from, from, but the developer is also given that opportunity to benefit to, uh, for the benefit of the archaeology. So I hope that's given a, a reasonable overview um, and thank you very much for listening.